My name is Johan Norberg, a writer and an analyst, and I was born and raised here in Sweden. I was three years old when the Nobel Prize in Economics was awarded to Milton Friedman here in Stockholm. This is Stockholm City Hall, the traditional place for the Nobel banquet. This is where Milton Friedman celebrated his prize. Milton Friedman did a lot more than win the Nobel Prize here in Stockholm. He had a thought-provoking message that won him thousands of advocates and opponents all over the world. In 2002, I had the pleasure of meeting Professor Friedman, and the thing that struck me was his intellectual curiosity. By Thomas Jefferson. His research led him to believe in the power of free markets and economic freedom, while many people today place a greater emphasis on government safety nets and greater financial equality. On this 30th anniversary of Milton Friedman's PBS television series, I'll revisit his ideas on the struggle between freedom and equality. Major funding for this program was provided by Thomas W. and Diane Smith. Additional funding was provided by Chris and Melody Rufer, Olaf Niels Sunda, Robert and Marion Oster, and the Hickory Foundation. No matter where you come from, whenever there's a problem, it's tempting to look to the government for solutions. Since the recession of 2008, we've seen unprecedented government intervention in the financial sector and in the automotive industry. We've seen new spending programs, more tariffs and new regulations, and we've seen the largest buildup of government debt in American history, a debt that might haunt us for generations. Some people blame the financial crisis on Milton Friedman and his theories of free markets. But Friedman would say that economic freedom is not just to reap the rewards when times are good, it's also to bear the consequences of your actions when times are bad. We don't have free markets as long as speculators can keep the profits when they win, but send the losses to the taxpayers when they lose. I was born and raised in Sweden, and my country has made an effort to make people's lives more equal. To reduce differences of outcome, we tax heavily and redistribute wealth among our citizens. And many people in the United States advocate a system like ours. If, on the other hand, the government gives everybody the same freedom to work and reap the rewards, some will do better than others. The result will be equality of opportunity, but not equality of outcome. Here in the United States, you've accepted more inequality of outcome. And over the past 30 years, a debate has been raging between these two competing alternatives. Can we live with economic freedom, even though it doesn't guarantee a specific result? even though it's built on the ongoing destruction of old ideas and businesses that are no longer competitive? Can we accept freedom, even though freedom to choose also means that we will not all be equally successful? To answer these questions, Milton Friedman traveled the world to examine various economic systems. He concluded that for most people, an emphasis on economic freedom would lead to both individual and political freedom. Many commentators say that Milton Friedman did more for freedom than anybody else in recent decades. He convinced many nations to embrace economic freedom. In the US, he led the effort to abolish the military draft, which he considered nothing less than slavery. It is long past time that we return to our basic heritage, got rid of the compulsion in our military service, and return to a voluntary system. When Milton Friedman died in 2006, The Economist magazine's obituary had the headline How Milton Freed Man. On the other hand, writers like the Canadian anti-capitalist Naomi Klein claim that he helped authoritarians by advising them to adopt free market economic policies. Most controversially, in 1975, Friedman traveled to Chile to lecture about economic liberalization, and he also met with the dictator, Augusto Pinochet. And in 1988, he went to China to talk to the communist leaders about economic reform. So who's right? Friedman would advise us to test his ideas by examining the evidence of recent history. Have his ideas changed our world? 
for better or for worse, whose assessment of his legacy is right? Milton Friedman is one of the most famous and influential economists of our time. He was born on July 31st, 1912, and received the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1976. As a professor of economics at the University of Chicago, he had great influence on the entire field of economics. He was an author and an advisor to several presidents. He spent most of his life promoting the benefits of a free market economic system. Friedman thought that most people are well equipped to take care of themselves, no matter where they come from, no matter what gender they are, no matter which race or creed they belong to. He thought that freedom from government barriers gave everybody the freedom to try, to start a business, to learn a trade, to get a good job, to become rich if they're successful. And it denied the powerful and the vested interest the right to distort the outcome. In 1980, Friedman presented his ideas to America through a 10-hour PBS series that was called Free to Choose. He traveled to places he felt could best communicate his ideas. Milton Friedman began his PBS series Free to Choose in New York City with a bit of personal history because he felt that it was important to remember how America's success story began. This statue is iconic. It represents freedom. And for the immigrants who were welcomed by the Statue of Liberty in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, America was truly a land of opportunity. They poured ashore in their best clothes, eager and expectant, carrying what little they owned. They were poor, but they all had a great deal of hope. Once they arrived, they found, as my parents did, not an easy life, but a very hard life. Friedman's parents passed through these doors here on Ellis Island, and they shared this background with millions of immigrants from all over the world. About a fifth of all Swedes migrated from my homeland to America to find a place where their own talents and hard work made a difference. Here on Ellis Island, they met the new world for the first time, and then they moved to the cities and to the frontier in search of the promise of the American dream. Not all of them found it, but many did. There were many rewards for hard work, enterprise, and ability. Life was hard, but opportunity was real. There were few government programs to turn to and nobody expected them. But also, there were few rules and regulations. There were no licenses, no permits, no red tape to restrict them. They found, in fact, a free market, and most of them thrived on it. This is exactly the same kind of a factory that my mother worked in when she came to this country for the first time at the age of 14, almost 90 years ago. And if there had not been factories like this here then at which she could have started to work and earned a little money, she wouldn't have been able to come. And if I existed at all, I'd be a Russian or a Hungarian today instead of American. But over the next 75 years, the United States began to restrict the workings of the free market. Every line of business was regulated, and soon the highest tax rate surpassed 70%. In 1980, when Friedman wanted to show a truly free economy, he took the viewer to the other side of the world.